So putting everything we have seen so far, right, and also to introduce a little bit more formalism, right. So we are going to define what we call the agent environment interface, slightly, uh, uh, you know, introducing some notations and other things that we we'll use for the rest of the uh, course, right. So the first thing that you have to notice that is an agent that is interacting in a close loop with the environment. So the agent is sensing state, taking an action, getting the next state and also a reward. So a few crucial assumptions that we are making, right. The first assumption I am making is that the agent and the environment interact at discrete time steps. So that is why we are, we are able to denote time as 0, 1, 2, 3. So we are not talking about wall clock time like 3.4 seconds, no talking about 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 and this is not really time, right, this is not really time. What we are looking at here is the decision steps, okay, how many actions have I taken or how many opportunities to take an action have I had, right, I might have chosen not to do anything as an action, but I have had that opportunity to take an action. So my time ticks, right, my time ticks or by how many opportunities I have had to take an action. So if you think of the game of tic-tac-toe, the maximum duration the tic-tac-toe experiment can run is for 5 time steps, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. You start first move, second move, third move, fourth move. I do not care about how long I took to make a move, how long my opponent took to take a, you know, uh, 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 make a response and so on and so forth, right. I can put one X and go away, have lunch and come back and my opponent would have put a O in between. Then I come and put another X, my time has moved from 0 to 1, that is all, right. It is not done anything else. So that is basically discrete time step. So the point I want you to have in mind is when I am talking right now, right, when I say time, it just means decisions, it does not mean how long it elapsed, right. Keep it in mind because later we will actually look at a version where we actually pay attention to time. But right now, time means it is the decision that has elapsed, okay. Uh, I am sorry, time means I have taken one decision for one time step, right, that is all it means not the how much time actually went in the wall clock, right. So I am going to assume that the agent observes the state at time t, so we will call that S t, right. And we are also going to assume that the set of states is discrete and is denoted by the symbol S. So capital S is the set of states and there is a discrete set of states, right. And at time t, I am going to observe the state S t. So, does not mean that it is S1, S3, S4, like it is not going as a, uh, that order, right. I could have n states, right. My S could be that's something that I wanted to keep in mind. My S could be 1 to n, right. I have n states, let us say. My S is 1 to n. So, my ST could be 3, right. I am sorry, my S0 could be 3. And my S1 could be 7, right. My S5 could again be 3, I could have gone a loop and come back to 3 and things like that. So when I say S0, that does not mean it is always the 0th state, it could mean anything, right. When I say S, S3, it does not mean it is the third state in this list, it means it is the third state that I see. It could be any of these states here, so just to make sure that we get that uh, uh, clear, right. So this ST is actually a random variable, right. ST is a random variable that denotes uh, what is the state at time t. So to be more precise. Likewise, uh, I have uh, uh, the action that the agent takes at time t. So uh, the agent observes the state at time t and in response to that, right, the agent observes the state at time t in response to that it takes action at, okay. And this at comes from some set which we call capital A and this capital A could change from state to state, right. Let us say you are playing the game of uh, tic-tac-toe. Initially, you have 9 possible moves you can make, right, but the next time you come to the board, you have only 7 moves that you can make because one you have already taken with the X and the another move has been taken by your opponent with an O, right, you can only make 7 possible moves, not, not 9 moves anymore. Like that for every state that you see, the number of moves and the, even the type of moves that you have available can vary, right. So that is why we sometimes note it by A of ST, but many of, quite often we just say A, right, we do not have the ST part. So what, what we have so far, we, the agent observes the state at time t, so we call it st, in response takes an action at and applies it to the environment and the environment causes the state uh, and causes the environment state to change to st plus 1 and also produces a reward rt plus 1. So rt plus 1 is a result of taking at in state st and moving to state st plus 1, so that is what rt plus 1 is, right, so you basically get 
st plus 1 rt plus 1. So, sometimes what people do is they model this as a joint distribution the probability of the next state and reward given s comma a that is sometimes what people do right. So, we will come back to when we can write this in the, in the, in the next slide right. So, if you think about what is happening between the environment and the agent you can think of the whole thing as I know as unrolling as shown here right. So, what do we mean by that? So, you have state st right you take action at you get reward rt plus 1 and go to state st plus 1 right this could happen. So, you get reward rt plus 1 and go to state st plus 1 and then you get take action at plus 1 in st plus 1 then you get reward rt plus 2 and go to state st plus 2 so on so forth right. So, this is essentially how uh, the, uh, the agent environment interaction will roll out and this sometimes we call as a is sometimes called a trajectory right and trajectories constitute what uh, uh, what is the experience for an RL agent and typically uh, you have this collection of these trajectories from which the RL agent learns how to solve the problem ok. Make sense? So, this agent senses the environment and state st takes action at goes to state st plus 1 and generates a reward rt plus 1 and this keeps continuing. So, you can see like a you generate a trajectory through the set of states right. And we are going to assume that the interaction happens in discrete time steps. Further, we are actually going to assume for most parts of the uh, uh, lecture, uh, uh, most parts of the course even that we are going to assume that the state space is discrete, right, and is given by the set S, uh, uh, like I had written earlier. And so the ST comes from the set S, and AT comes from a set A, which is again a set of discrete actions, right, and uh, you get a reward RT plus 1, which is typically a real valued uh, uh, scalar quantity that we are talking about and you get the next state st plus 1 which also comes from capital S right. So, all of these when I say typically when I say st at I am, I am talking about random variables not specific actions or specific states just remember that ok good. So, the first assumption that we make that makes our life so much simpler as we go along is something known as the Markov assumption right. Uh, so, the Markov uh, assumption or the Markov property uh, says the following right. So, if you are looking at a dynamical system like we are talking about right you are in state S you apply action A you go to state S prime and all that right. So, the state at a step T right state at time T. So, is basically all the information that is available to the uh, agent about the environment right all the relevant information available to the agent about the environment right. So, we will see examples of how the state state is and what it looks like and so on and so forth right. The states can be just what you perceive just like you look at the board and you see the uh, pieces right you look at the board and you see x's and o's on the board that could be your state just the snapshot of the, uh, the, the board can be your state. Uh, sometimes your state can be like a history of sequences of positions that you have seen right. Uh, like like you know going cycling your boat could be ok how he has been weaving in and out what is the last three positions of the center of gravity that this person had and so on. So, so that sequences could be your state right and sometimes you are just thinking about a problem and trying to formulate the problem your state could just be some abstract entity that indicates that uh, certain conditions are met right. The state could be ok battery is full could be a state right it indicates that the that condition is met battery full condition is met. So, there could be many ways in which you can define the state and we will see how this uh, uh, works out right. And uh, but ideally what we are assuming is that the state should have all the essential quote unquote essential information you need to be able to predict the systems behavior right. So, what do I mean? So, if I know STAT right if I know the current st state at time t and this action at time t. I should not need any of the previous information I should not need any of the previous information to tell me what is the probability of the next state and what is the probability of the next reward I am going to get. So, that is basically what we are saying here right probability of st comma uh, st plus 1 comma rt plus 1 given st at rt st minus 1 at minus 1 blah 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 is equal to the probability of st plus 1 and rt plus 1 given st and at not the history beyond that right. So, this is called the Markov property the fact that you are not dependent on history right and your dynamics right. So, how your system is going to move how your state is going to move depends only on your current state the state at time t and your current action at right. 
if it is dependent only on ST and AT, not on the history before that, you say that it is satisfies the Markov property. So, that the system satisfies the Markov property and this, ho this should hold for all states and all histories, right? All, all possible S prime, all possible R and all histories of this. It should not be that, okay, for sometimes if ST is equal to S3, then I do not need to know the history. But if ST is equal to S7, then I need to know the history. So, if it's, it should not be like that. If ST equal to 3, then I do not know the history. I do not need the history. If ST equal to 7, then I need the history, the last 5 states, right? Still, it does not satisfy the Markov property. So, when we say it satisfies the Markov property, it does so for all states and all actions. So, remember I was writing this probability distribution here, right. So, the I wrote it as P of S prime gamma R given S gamma A, this already assumes that the Markov property holds because I only used S and A, I have not used any anything that came before S and A, right. So, that is that is essentially the, uh, the idea here. So, we are going to assume that the Markov property holds, right. So, now using this, I am going to define all of this, all of this agent environment interface, every, all the discussions that went on before, right, kind of a leading up to this whole idea of a Markov decision process. So, I am going to define what is called a Markov decision process. So, the Markov decision process is the tuple given by S, A, P and R, right, where S is the set of states like we talked about earlier. It could be an enumeration of the set of states or it could be some kind of a continuous state, space that you define. Typically, for the purposes of uh, most of the lectures, we will be using this as a finite discrete set, right. So, this is a finite discrete set of states like positions in uh, tic-tac-toe, right. And A is a set of actions and again we are going to assume it is finite discrete. So, halfway through the uh, uh, course we will actually switch to looking at uh, continuous states and continuous actions and things like that. But for the time being, we are going to assume finite discrete states and finite discrete actions. And then you have a function p and a function r, right. So, p is essentially the probability of transition. So, what do we mean by that? So, I am in state, uh, uh, you know, S1, right. I do action A1. So, what is the probability I will end up in some state S prime, right. So, for every possible S prime, I am going to have one value here, right. So, for taking action A1 in S1, right, suppose I have m states, I am going to have m or m minus 1 values for the probability of landing up in any one of these extra states, right. And like that, for every state action combination, I will have one entry, right. So, for every state action combination, I will have a set of n numbers or m numbers or whatever number of states m, n, right. So, I will have a set of n numbers corresponding to the probability distribution over the next state starting from some state s doing an action A, okay. So, that is basically the transition probability model, right. And the next thing we are looking at is something called the expected reward, right. So, what do we mean by the expected reward? So, normally, you know, analogous to the transition probability, I should have looked at something like probability of R given S A S prime, right. So, what do we mean by that? Suppose I am in state S, I take action A, I end up in state S prime, what is the reward I am going to get? right for the probability so of this right. So, what is the probability that r equal to 3 let us say. Right? So, like this I will have a distribution this time it is not a discrete distribution because r is from the real numbers. So, I will have some distribution over r right. So, what we are doing here is instead of saying that we are going to model this probability distribution. So, I am saying that I am going to do the expected value of this probability distribution. I am going to do the expected value of this probability distribution uh, to get the, uh, 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 the quantity r here. So, when I say r of s a s prime, I actually mean this expected value of the reward given that I was in state s, I took action a and ended up in state s prime, right and that, that gives me the expected value. Like I said, sometimes we actually marginalize over the reward and write it as the next state uh, the probability of uh, transition and also the expected reward. Sometimes people are happy writing this, right, joint distribution over the reward and the uh, next state, right. So, you could write it like this, which combines both, right, or normally you do it this way, right. So, that and then this, okay. 
Now, the goal of this agent, remember it was to learn a mapping from states to actions, right? So, what we are going to say is the goal of the agent is to learn something called a policy pi, right? Learn a policy pi. The policy pi is actually that mapping from states to action, right? So, just denoting something, how we will do this policy pi, and I say pi a given s, right? Or pi of s comma a, right? So, people use various notations for it. So, if I use pi of a given s or pi of s comma a, this is essentially the probability that a t equal to a given s t equal to s, okay. So, that is that is the distribution. So, this pi for every s is going to have, suppose you have m actions, you are going to have m values for every state s. So, that is basically what the pi would be, right. Sometimes, sometimes it is more convenient to assume that even if the no, even if the transition is uh, you know probabilistic or even if the transition is stochastic, right, your policy pi can be deterministic, right. So, what do I mean by that? That means that pi of a given s equal to 1 for some s, right, let us say a equal to a 1 equal to 0 otherwise. So, that means pi a 1 of a, a 1 given s equal to 1, that means I will always do a 1 in the state s otherwise it will be 0. So, what we do is sometimes in that such happens, we write it like this as a proper function. So, pi of s equal to a 1, that means I will only do a 1 in state s, there is no probability distribution or anything here. So, that is what we mean by saying that the, uh, uh, that the state can be deterministic, I am sorry, that the policy can be deterministic. So, the goal of the agent as we told you already is to maximize total expected rewards, again I will make it clear what I mean by total expected reward as we go along and talk about value functions other things later, right. Goal of the agent uh, is to maximize the total expected reward and the policy, right, the agent is learning a policy. The policy that achieves the maximum of the total expected reward is called a optimal policy, right. The policy that achieves the maximum of the total expected reward is called an optimal policy. So, the goal of the agent is to learn an optimal policy.